Praise the Lord. I'm going to ask you tonight if you would pull up a chair to the table of the Lord and get ready for a meal, okay? Get ready for a meal tonight. This is not going to be milk tonight, okay? So tonight we're going to, we're going to dive deeply into the meat of God in the book if you want to grab your Bible or your devices, we're going to be in the book of 2 Timothy chapter 4, and we're going to conclude tonight a series that we've been in for a number of weeks called Resilient Faith. We're going to do it in 2 Timothy chapter 4. I want to first just bring you some good news from some things that have been going on uh, this week here in the community. Praise the Lord, we had some new babies this week. And you know I love babies. I do what I can to encourage them. I do take credit for some of the babies that we're having now. Because some time ago we had a, just a, a presence of the Lord that came and we began to speak life and birth and fruitfulness over all of our families. And then all of a sudden this big burst of babies started coming. So I do take credit for them. So we had our first baby in King of Kings Community Herzliya this week. Amen? Amen? Praise the Lord for Daniel and Jaylene Geppert. A few of us did thank the Lord for that. Um, I won't tell you the name because they may want to say that publicly, but I do know the name. And I'm happy to announce that my family somehow got in the name. So that's... That's a credit back to having something to do with the anointing being passed on. Just remember that when they announce the name, that my family's in the name. Just remember that. I'm not going to tell you which, which part of our family, but you'll recognize it. Uh, also this week, those of you that have ever eaten at our cafe, Cafe Forte, our manager, her name is Dikla. Dikla has had her new baby this week, another baby girl this week as well. So hallelujah, praise the Lord for that. And I'm just assuming if you're not clapping that you're one of those people who don't like children. So I don't know <laughs> what in the world. How can you not be clapping? I just said baby and you didn't clap. I don't understand. That was like saying puppy and be like, ooh, boo, puppies. <laughs> don't like puppies. You don't like babies. <laughs> but thank you for your prayers. We, we have, listen, I told you there's a, like a long train of babies coming. We've got another one that's already due this week. So be in prayer for Kelly as, as she's... Uh, cooking overtime, if you would. Uh, she's already past due, and uh, the rest of the babies are on their way. I don't know if you guys know this, but my wife is 21 weeks pregnant as well, so <laughs> praise the Lord. So listen, I don't just tell other people to have babies. I do what I can as well. Amen? Hallelujah. <laughs> praise the Lord. You got to loosen up a little bit tonight. Come on. <laughs> Come on. You know, it's hard to eat if your mouth is closed, right? So loosen up a little bit tonight. It's going to be good. The word of God is good. 2 Timothy chapter 4. Chapter 4. I bring you greetings as you're turning there from Ebenezer Congregation in Tel Aviv. I was just uh, there speaking yesterday. It's one of the King of Kings family uh, congregations. And uh, boy, they've got a good thing going on there in Tel Aviv right now in the Ethiopian community. They just moved into their new sanctuary. It's one of the most lively bunches I've been around in a number of years. Uh, there was... There was Great worship, there was dancing, a whole lot of shouting going on, a whole lot of horns were being blown, and some wonderful hot Ethiopian food was served afterwards. That's how they stay awake, you know, during the long services there. They serve you some hot food there. So they bring greetings from Pastor Argo and Dargachu. Say that with me, Argo and Dargachu. Okay, good, we can send him that recording, team. Remember, we're going to send that recording to Pastor Argo because we did such a good job. Hallelujah. Last week, Pastor Wayne challenged us to put the Word of God to use the way it's supposed to be used. To not use the Word God of God out of context, but to use the Word of God, to use the Scriptures correctly, accomplishing what God wants to accomplish in our life. Tonight, I want to begin with the reading of the first 
eight verses of 2 Timothy chapter 4. So let's do that together. Let's take our time here. This is the main text tonight. You won't really have to turn to any other passages, but we will use this as our main text. I charge you, therefore, before God and the Lord Yeshua, the Messiah, who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom, to preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. But you be watchful in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day, and not to me only, but also to those who have loved his appearing." We're coming to the end of this series. We're coming to the end of Paul's letters to Timothy. If you know any of the background of the books of 1st and 2nd Timothy, they come at the very end of Paul's ministry life. They're one of his last writings that we know of. So at this point, he's an older gentleman. He's been around the world. He's preached at just about every congregation there is. He's planted many places many communities. He's identified and trained and, and appointed elders and pastors and leaders all over the world. He's been persecuted in many cities. He's been in jail several times. He's been beaten. He's been left for dead. At the end of all of that, he's writing to one of his dearest sons of the faith, Timothy, a, a future leader, or if not a leader already by the time he receives this letter. What's important here to note about the background of Paul's life as he's writing 1st and 2nd Timothy is that he's at the end, and he knows he's at the end. He sees the finish line. And when you see the finish line and you realize that your time in that role is almost over, you're going to start thinking about the most important things that you want to pass on because your time is short. It's the same thing we taught about a few weeks ago when Yeshua had already risen from the dead. He spent 40 days with his disciples and he was about to ascend to heaven to be with the Father. And it was at that time in Matthew 28 that he gives us the great commission to preach the gospel and make disciples because this is the most important thing he can think of just before he leaves. And this is a trend that you find in the Bible that when, when, a, when a man of God or a woman of God is about to finish that role, they try to pour out the last bit they can remember that's urgent at the moment. What is most urgently on their heart. Tonight's message, urgency. That's what we've entitled it tonight, urgency. What is on Paul's heart here as he's coming to the end of his ministry life? In chapter 4, verse 1, and in verse 8, which will be our main two verses that will bounce back and forth between tonight, he mentions the Lord's appearing, the Lord's appearing. He says, his appearing, the Lord's appearing. These phrases of the Lord's appearing or his appearing, they only show up five times in the whole New Testament. Ironically, four of those times are in the book of Timothy, showing you what is urgently on the heart of Paul as he's coming to the end of his time here on earth in his ministry. What is urgently on Paul's heart is the appearing of the Lord Yeshua. That's what's propelling him. That's what's pushing him. That's what's driving him every day is to think about and live for the return of the Lord. And he phrases the return of the Lord by saying his appearing. And again, he's talking about the second coming of the Lord. Five times in the New Testament, but four of those times we find it here in the book of Timothy. The Greek word here for his appearing or the appearing, epiphania. You might recognize it because it's close to the word epiphany. And yes, they are the same rooted word. That when you see the Lord, you have an epiphany. What is the literal definition of this Greek word? It means a manifestation or a divine supernatural being. And so it is 
precisely used correctly here in Paul's writing, that he is talking about the revelation, the manifestation of Yeshua, his appearing and his second coming. So I mentioned two of those five times in verse 1 and verse 8, but here are the other three times. Remember, there will be two more in Timothy, and the third one or the fifth one in total will be in the book of Titus. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 14 says about Yeshua's appearing, I charge you to keep this command without spot or blame until the appearing of our Lord Yeshua the Messiah. 2 Timothy 1, 9 and 10, he has saved us and called us to a holy life, not because of anything that we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. This grace was given to us in Yeshua before the beginning of time, but it has now been revealed through the appearing of our Lord and Savior Yeshua, who has destroyed death and brought us life and immortality. Titus chapter 2, verse 12. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age while we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Yeshua the Messiah. There are other instances in the New Testament where the appearing of the Lord or the appearing of something having to do with Yeshua shows up. But these are the five times it literally says his appearing. Two more times that you might come across in your study that something is appearing when it pertains to Yeshua himself, Acts chapter 9. Remember when the apostle Paul is on the road to Damascus and he's going to persecute the believers. He has death and imprisonment in mind for the Messianic believers. And while he's on the road to go to Damascus, it says Yeshua appeared to him. And that was the epiphany that Paul needed, if you will. It was the manifestation of God's reality that Paul needed. That was one of the other mentions, although it doesn't use the actual term. It describes the same term. Another time that you might find in your scripture study comes from the book of Matthew chapter 2 when the wise men are feeling called and led to the birth of Yeshua and it says that the star was appearing. Again, connected to Yeshua, but not directly Yeshua's appearing itself. So let's get back into our main text here, 2 Timothy chapter 4. I want to read verse 1 and verse 8 again. I told you these will be the two main verses tonight. Verse 1 and verse 8. I charge you therefore before God and the Lord Yeshua the Messiah, who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Jump down to verse 8. Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day, and not to me only, but also to all who have loved his appearing. Why do I link those two verses? What's unique about these two verses in this study is that Paul mentions his appearing twice, and in each sentence where he says the Lord's appearing, he uses the word judgment. I don't know if you caught it. Listen to it again. Now that I've told you, listen to how it reads again. I charge you therefore before God and the Lord Yeshua, who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing. Did you catch it? He will judge the living and the dead at his appearing. When we are excited about the appearing of the Lord, when we're excited about the second coming of the Messiah, do we understand the implications that that has? Here's the meat tonight. We can be very excited. We can preach the gospel. We can make disciples. We can talk to people about the Lord's return. He's going to return as the king. He's going to return as the peacemaker. He's going to return as the protector of Israel. He's going to return as the restorer of all good things. And although we do want to preach these principles, we can't preach the the appearance of the Lord without talking about judgment. Because if you want the appearing of the Lord, you have to receive judgment comes with it. And that's why we're family here tonight. We're going to speak on these terms. Paul sees a direct link between the appearing of the Lord and the judgment of sin that will directly follow the appearing of Yeshua. Paul understands that when we pray about Yeshua's second coming, that this has major implications. This is not just a friendly visit. It's not just a friendly visit. We don't get the picture of Yeshua coming back and saying, hey guys, just checking in with you. 
saw your email, thought I might stop in just to see how things are going. How's my kingdom growing? How's my message moving forward? How's my power working in you? How's the Holy Spirit guiding you? Just checking in, taking a quick temperature of the body. This is not a friendly visit, this next one. And Paul gets it. Paul gets the urgency that at the end of his own ministry, he has to point people toward the coming of the Messiah and remind them that when the Messiah returns, it comes with judgment. And this is important to Paul, the spiritual father. Now, how do we know that Paul is sensing this level of urgency? Well, I focused on verse 1 and verse 8, but there's other verses sandwiched between them. All of you math scholars know that I'm talking about verses 2 through 7. Good, some of you laughed at that. Here are a few snippets of what's going on between verse 1 and 8. So we're talking about verses 2 through 7. Let me just give you a few of the phrases. Paul says, I charge you. Preach the word. Be ready. Do the work of an evangelist. The time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. His language is a language of urgency. He's out. He's done, and he knows it. And he knows that the clock is ticking, and he doesn't have much longer to say many more things. He doesn't have many more visits on his itinerary. And it's propelling him in heart to be a good spiritual father and to prepare the body of Messiah. So even his own language shows urgency here. But he does understand that the coming of Yeshua comes with imminent judgment. Now, this urgency, of course, it's written to Timothy, so he wants Timothy to feel the same urgency that he's feeling. But it's not just for Timothy. God's word is this this great miracle that can be written for the individual at the time of the writing, and yet it can be used in principle for us as well today. So here at King of Kings, when we talk about the word of God, we give the word of God the highest place of authority in our life. We don't think, let me just clarify for some of you who may not know our position on the scriptures, we don't think there is one error in this entire Bible. We don't believe a translator got it wrong. We don't believe that a word was twisted around. We don't believe that some Greek guy in the past made a mistake. We don't believe that there should be books in here that are not. We don't believe that our... Uh, books out there that should be in here. We believe in this word because this word of God is perfect to the converting of the soul. It is sweet as honey. It follows the path of righteousness. There are no mistakes in this word and we build our life on this foundation. The same God who went on Mount Sinai and spoke face to face with Moses and gave him the Torah is the same God who who wrote the rest. And there are many in the world right now who are having trouble deciphering between the authority of certain scriptures. I had a wonderful conversation with my oldest daughter this week. She's here in the audience tonight, and so I feel like I'm comfortable in this space because I'm not talking behind her back. There might be some other sermons online in the archives where I did that, but right now I'm not going to do that. (laughs) All good things, sweetie. All good things. We talked about this week, why do we give the scriptures authority? Because God face-to-face talked to Moses and told him, write this down. And Moses wrote it down. And we trust that because God spoke to Moses. And then he spoke to the prophets, and the prophets' writings line up with the law of Moses. And then we get into the Ketuvim, the writings, the poetry, and we find out that these people were following hard after God. And when they weren't following after God, God was quick to judge them, following the same consistency of the Torah. And then we get into the New Testament, and someone might say, well, where's the authority of the New Testament fall? How do we we know to give it authority? 
Well, if Moses talk, uh, God talking to Moses was enough, then certainly Yeshua God talking to the disciples was enough. And so we give the Gospels, the Besalot. We give them authority. There's not actually not that many writers in the New Testament, is there? You go through and look at it. There's only six or seven, eight writers of the whole New Testament. Most of them were disciples. They walked with God. And so we give them authority to tell us what God said. Thus, we are building the authority of the New Testament as well. And then you get into the writings of Paul and you say, well, Paul wasn't there with Yeshua. He wasn't a disciple. He, didn't, uh, he wasn't on the mountain with God. He didn't see God face to face. I would beg to differ. Paul saw God three times. And if God talking to Moses was enough to give the Torah authority, then God speaking to Paul is enough to give Paul's writings authority. So if anyone in your life tries to argue with you or combat with you that they don't believe in the authenticity or the authority of the New Testament, you tell them it came from the same authority source that the Torah came from. It came from God's own mouth. And we don't change it. We don't think there's any games being played in the Bible. We just think it's God's heart for his people. And it is perfectly consistent from beginning to end. Praise the Lord for that. Now, some of you are saying, hey, Chad, listen, I'm following your logic here. The coming of the Lord Yeshua is eminently connected with his judgment. But doesn't that sound contradictory to what the apostle John wrote, where John said, Yeshua didn't come to judge and condemn? Well, let's read what John said. John chapter 3, verse 16 to 18. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. A lot of liberals right now in the body of Messiah want to stop right there. God did not come into the world to condemn the world, but to save him. And they want to stop, as if there's not another half of the chapter yet to come. If we were smart and wise, we would read the rest of the chapter. Because this is what it actually says. For God did not come into the world, he did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already. You see, the issue of Yeshua is not one of neutrality. Here's the picture the world wants you to think about. They want you to think that there is Yeshua the Savior, a neutral middle ground. You're Switzerland, right? And then, any Swiss people here tonight? Okay, we bless you. And over here, we have Sin and hell and unrighteousness. And that's the picture they want. They want Yeshua, neutrality, and then sin and hell and everything dark and bad. And they want to paint a picture like you can stand in the middle. The word of God says this. But whoever does not believe stands condemned already. There is no neutral. Either you are with Yeshua or you're already condemned to hell. When Yeshua is coming to save, he's not saving us from neutrality. He is saving us from the grips of hell. You follow me? But the world doesn't want you to think that way. The body of Messiah right now is even struggling with this thought. Like there's a middle ground somewhere. Matthew 12, verse 30 says this, Yeshua's own voice, whoever is not with me is against me, and whoever does not gather with me, he scatters. Yeshua is very clear. There is no middle. There is no neutral. It is with me or not with me. And Paul sees this. He says, if you want the appearing of the Lord, you get the judgment. Those are the only two things. You're going to have one or you're going to have the other. You're going to have Yeshua or you're going to have this this judgment, sense of condemnation. We should also just point out for the sake of those scholars in the room that when John 3 is being mentioned, it's mentioning Yeshua's first coming. Right? When he says, God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world. He's talking about his first coming. Paul is writing in 2 Timothy 4 about Yeshua's second coming. So just for contextualization, understand the difference in, in your Bible. 
As if I needed to hammer that point home one more time. Revelation chapter 3 verse 15 says, I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. Friends, there's no neutral. It's with Yeshua or not with Yeshua. There's no, I'm a good person. No, I'm sorry. I'm sorry to break the news to the world, those watching online as well. You're not a good person. Oh, man, that sounded horrible. Pastor Chad, how do you expect to keep the doors of this congregation open by saying stuff like that? You can't tell the people of this world right now that they're not good. That's dangerous. You can't tell the believers around the world that they're not good. Friends, we're not good. If we were good, we wouldn't need Yeshua. It says we stood condemned already. That's how good we were. We were already condemned. It says our righteousness, our best day, the best we've ever been, equaled filthy rags according to God. Now, through God's washing, we've become clean. We've become pure. We've become forgiven. Yes. But without Yeshua, we're not good. And Paul senses this. He senses the urgency. He can see the direction that the the believers are, they're they're wanting to go. They're wanting to go. Even today, we can feel it. Friends, in this room, let's be honest. Can we speak the truth tonight? Am I going to step on someone's toes? Probably so. If we speak the truth tonight, We don't like this message. This, you say, Pastor Chad, I was loving the worship because it was making me feel good. And Pastor Mike, I love when he came up here because he was saying some really kind things about trusting in the Lord. And Dave, what a reading, just smooth. I was loving it. And then you got up here and wrecked everything. Sometimes that's my job. (laughs) Holy Spirit, would you move in this room right now in the name of Yeshua? We're just going to stop, friends. Close your eyes with me. Holy Spirit, move in this room. Please come. There are some people here that need this word. And everything within them is fighting. Their, Their spirit, their mind, their body is fighting against them right now. The Holy Spirit's trying to break through. It's making them agitated in the inside. If you're feeling agitated tonight, I'm telling you, that's not the Holy Spirit. That's your flesh. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Help us. Help us, Holy Spirit. Friends, listen. We're speaking of some very unpopular things tonight. We've not been afraid to do this from the pulpit. Last week, Pastor Wayne went head on with the spirit of homosexuality. Head on. It was one of the strongest messages I've heard in a long time about the boundaries of God's righteousness. And just to be clear, if you haven't seen the recap, we believe in the clarity of the Bible that the Bible gives one framework, one option For sexual encounters, one. And that is when a man marries a woman and in the covenant of marriage, sexual interaction is allowed. If there's any other option that doesn't fit that one, it is not revealed as holy in the Bible. It's not revealed as blessed in the Bible. It's not revealed as permissible in the Bible. God has given us very clear boundaries on these things. But we haven't shied away from these unpopular topics like judgment, sin, repentance, asking people to consider change, being conformed to the image of Yeshua, becoming accountable for their life, living a life of righteousness. We know it's unpopular, but you know what? Most of the prophets were unpopular as well. The disciples were certainly unpopular. The apostles, nobody could stand them when they came into town. Yeshua wasn't exactly a circus parade when he came in. You know, you do see the one time that there's this triumphal entry. That was a rare occasion, friends. 
Most of the time when Yeshua came in, there were thousands listening to him and thousands waiting to speak against him. Unpopular messages that we need to speak about. This generation has been sold a lie. And the lie is the word tolerance. For some reason, our current society has decided that tolerance for unrighteousness is a new moral virtue. Did you hear that? That was from the Holy Spirit. Our society has decided that tolerance for unrighteousness has now become a moral virtue. The more you can allow sin, the more you can accept it, the more loving you are. It's like this twisted lie. Like it's a moral virtue to, lo- to allow sin to continue to grow. The good news tonight, the clarity of the word of God is that principle is not in the Bible. The Bible is not about tolerance. The Bible is about saving people. But to save them, you have to tell them where they are and what you're saving them from or what Yeshua is saving them from. The close of this letter, what's passionately on our hearts as pastors here at King of Kings, what's passionately on Paul's heart is leading us tonight to close this book and open the new series next week that we're calling Rescue. Out of the urgency of tonight, we're starting a new series next week called Rescue. The word judgment shows up in the Bible 121 times. Did you know that? The word judged shows up 55 times. So over 175 times, if you really want to do some research on judgment and its role in the scriptures, I know it's unpopular, but let me tell you where we're all headed, friends. Revelation chapter 19, verse 11, I saw heaven standing open, and there before me was a white horse whose rider is called Faithful and True. With justice, he judges and he makes war. His eyes are like blazing fire, and on his head are many crowns. He has a name written on him that no one knows but he himself. He is dressed in a robe dipped in blood, and his name is the Word of God. And what does the Word of God do? It comes to judge. Remember, the appearing of the Lord always is connected with his judgment. Revelation 19, when he comes on this white horse, what does he come to do? He comes to judge. Our mission statement here at King of Kings is to be a compelling, Messiah-centered, spirit-empowered, disciple-making covenant community who reveals the true face of Yeshua to Israel and the nations. What's his true face? Tolerance? A blind eye to sin? That's not the true face of Yeshua. Do you know there's there's a balance between You've ever heard this phrase, you can love someone into the kingdom of God? Raise your hand if you've ever heard that phrase or the principle in general. You can love someone into the kingdom of God. I'm not knocking the statement because it it has some merit to it. You love people into the knowledge that God has done something in your life and that leads them to curiosity to open the conversation. So I'm not knocking the merit of that. But do you know you can love people to hell? Because that's the tolerance message. Love them to hell. Be, be, hold their hand, kindly walk with them all the way to hell. And when you, when you deliver them, tell them, but I, I loved you. I was tolerant with you. I was patient with you. I never once said anything about my belief system. I never once tried to push my religion on you. Aren't you so happy? that I loved you all the way to hell? This is not what Paul wants us to do. Paul senses urgency. He says, if you want to call for the appearing of the Lord, you accept that the judgment is coming with it. I understand this is not popular, friends, but this is where we're all headed. You know, you'll you'll hear that phrase, listen, we all have a few things in life that we're going to deal with. And you'll even hear that phrase coupled with And death is one of them. It's actually not entirely true. Because some will not die, right? At least in theory. If 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 some are in the generation that comes alive at the coming of the Lord, there's there's this opportunity where they may or may not die according to Revelation. 
You go and search for that yourself. Find out what you think about it. But I can tell you one thing that every one of us is going to do, every one of us living and dead, judgment. Every one of us ends up in the same spot at the end of our life. We all end up with judgment. And so in the sense of urgency, let me tell you a quick story before I close. The urgency that Paul was feeling when he was closing out his ministry is the urgency that we need to feel as believers in this current age. This past week, we had a tragedy. There was a family, a a good, dear family at, at one of the congregations we pastored at prior. And they had several children. The marriage was struggling. They're professing believers but their marriage was struggling, so they separated. And they got back together. They separated again. They're struggling. They're, they're, they're fighting. They're, they're just having a hard time to make this marriage work smoothly. They were separated. Now what do you do with the children? The children went to live with mom, but then one of the children wanted to live with dad, and now they had to split home again. So the mom ended up leaving her home, the home they were in, to be with her family in a different state. Now you have a mom and a dad in two different states and children are split down the middle. So it was time for the children, the rest of the children, to go visit dad. So they all met together to fly up to to meet where dad was. And so a friend picked them up at the airport and they, they went to dad's house. Remember, they're separated. They went to dad's house, knocked on the door, nobody came to the door. Knocked on the door again. Nobody came to the door. They called mom in a different state. Why is dad not picking up, uh, answering the door? I don't know. Let me call a friend. They'll come over and help you. Called a friend. The friend drove over. Knocked on the door. No answer. Really concerned them. Called the police. Police came. Knocked on the door. No answer. This week, friends, it happened. Police broke down the door. He had died. The kids are no longer with their mom because she sent them to visit dad after the separation. The kids are now in a state by themselves hoping to be with their dad who is young and he passed away. Urgency. Urgency. Paul senses urgency and he's telling Timothy, Timothy, you have to get this with me. I am feeling urgency. Our pastoral team is feeling urgency. We can see the direction of the world. Guys, we can even see the direction of some of the body of Messiah. That's not good. And there's an urgency to say, would you come with us? Would you help us? Would you preach this Bible strongly the way it was written without trying to rewrite it to try to make other people happy? Urgency. Worship team, you'll help me here. I'm going to close with this this summary. Have we let the influence of this generation impact our views of the Bible? Have we wanted to be accepted by the unbelievers so much that we are afraid of speaking of tough things? Are we afraid of speaking of sin, repentance, atonement, judgment, righteousness, accountability? Are we afraid of speaking about a lifestyle that needs to be changed once we yield to the lordship of Yeshua? It can't be our goal to make everyone around us happy and love them all the way to hell. I would rather someone be mad at me and see them in heaven then like me a whole lot and be separated from them forever in hell. We close this study of the book of 1 and 2 Timothy the same way Paul closed his own ministry in his own writings with a renewed sense of urgency for what we are called to be and what we're called to do. We are called to preach the gospel and make disciples. It's very straightforward. But you cannot preach the gospel without using the words sin, repentance, forgiveness, and judgment. We need to share the realities of these things with those that we say we love and show them that we really do love them 
by telling them the truth. Bow your heads with me as we close. Holy Spirit, we thank you for walking with us tonight. You were so gracious. Not the easiest words, of course, but certainly we sensed your presence guiding us through it. Thank you for the meat of your word today. We trust your word. We trust its authenticity and its authority. We pray for those tonight that had a battle going on inside of them, that they would come to yield and trust in the gentle hands of the Messiah. We pray that as we fulfill the Great Commission, that we do so with urgency today. That we are not like the seed that fell on soil and let the cares of the world choke out its fruitfulness. What greater priority do we have tonight than to rescue others? I bless each person in this room with the blessing that Paul gave to Timothy at the close of this book. And he said, fulfill your ministry. Do the thing you were called to do. Move with urgency and in the power of the Holy Spirit that's been released for you. Run your race. Finish strong. And remember that the imagery of running your race is not someone on the sidelines. It's not someone disengaged from the war. Running is running. It's engaging in the battle that you're already in, whether you want to be in it or not. So we release that kind of authority, passion, love for people, and urgency tonight through this message. In the name of Yeshua, we pray. Amen.